<coughs> okay, this is an abridged version of chapter four of my um, forthcoming uh, tome, 500 page tome called Writing Beyond Realism, Ishikawa Jun and the Case Against Modern Japanese Literature, a Critical Study with New Translations. And I've already made videos of uh, abridged versions of the introduction and chapters one, two, and three. If you haven't watched those already, um, go ahead and do so before watching this one because this chapter will make more sense after having uh, listened to or read, uh, if you have a copy of this, um, the first sections of the book, uh, okay, especially the introduction in which I explain the sort of overall project that I'm trying to uh, Im engage in. All right, here's chapter four, Fantasy as Antidote to Shajitsushugi. And Shajitsugi, of course, is the uh, system of copying actuality, a uh, word that uh, comes up in a lot of his, uh, histories of modern Japanese literature, and it means basically realism. So fantasy is antidote to Shajitsushugi. All right, starting with the epigraph here at the top of the chapter. Le rêve est une seconde vie. And that's from Gérard de Neval, from his book Aurelia. Le rêve to la vie. And uh, Iskaju mentions Neval in this story, uh, Yamazakura, that I analyzed in this chapter. And the second quotation in the epigraph is from Tsubo Shoyo's The Essence of the Novel, which I discussed in the introduction to this book. Uh, Shousetsu Shinzi is the original uh, title of that work. And the quotation here in the epigraph is, The true novel shuns absurd nonsense and fanciful extremes of mystery. Right, so there's this kind of suppression of fantasy, of Genso Bungaku, that begins in the Meiji period as realism becomes the ascendant uh, mode of literary production and uh, Ishikawa Jun is sort of reacting against that idea. Th um, and one of his ways of, of doing so is to explore the possibilities of fantasy, which is what this chapter is about. All right, make sure I'm still recording here. Still recording. Okay, here's uh, the chapter. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's an abridged version. There are copious footnotes included. I'm not going to read the footnotes, obviously. You can wait till the book comes out to uh, read those. If we conflate for a moment the narrator of Kajin, the fair one, 1935, which is the story that I um, analyzed in chapter three of this book. If we conflate the moment, conflate the mo for a moment the narrator of that work with the author. Ishikajun himself, we might say that Yamazakura, The Wild Cherry Tree, 1936, which is the work I analyzed in this chapter, represents the fulfillment of Ishikawa's wish to elevate all of this ugliness to the realm of the strange, the fantastic. That's the uh, famous ending of the work Kajin. The story picks up, Yamazakura picks up precisely where the narrator of Kajin, or the fair one, left off, taking a somewhat tawdry story about an illicit love affair and the resulting child and elevating it to a kind of conte fantastique that blurs the lines between reality and dream, past and present, san sanity and madness, literality and allegoricity. As such, the story prefigures Ishikawa's post-war works of Genso Bungaka, fantasy literature, which are marked by a sense of disorientation, hallucination, and make-believe, and a focus on unconscious desires, dream worlds, dream worlds, and madness. And then in the footnote, I mention um, some of the major works of fantasy that Ishikawa wrote throughout his career, and I'll read them here just so you know what they are, and all these need to be translated into English, so if somebody wants to embark on a project uh, to translate more of Ishikawa's works, we can uh, contact me and we'll do so. And I translate, of course, four essays, literary essays by Ishikawa, and three uh, works of fiction in this large tome, but there's still much that needs to be uh, translated into English. And the works of fantasy that he wrote are Freewheeling Taoist Immortals. I should have the uh, title there in the original. I didn't include it. Iron, Iron Clutch Li, about the Chinese uh, Taoist sort of uh, legendary figure. Shigure Kasen, a Kasen-linked verse on the late autumn showers, 1955. Vimala Kirti's Inexhaustible Light, The Jesus of the Ruins, Sorori's Tales, Kakushigoto, Kai Sekibutsukuyo, the Mysterious Girl, cause there's a f okay, there's um, a long list there. You, we don't need to go over all these, but there's just keep in mind that many of Ishikawa's works are fantasy works, and they all need to be translated. 
The Wild Cherry Tree, Yamazakura, was first published in the n- January 1936 edition of Bungei Handong. It's the name of the journal. Uh, the work has been much praised by writers and critics. Suzuki Sadami, the famous uh, Suzuki Sami, Sadami, who was at Nichi Bunken for many years, recently re- retired. Suzuki Sadami, writing in Eureka, called the work a superb piece of zepping from his early period and a, quote, skillfully crafted fantasy lo- novel that inherits the in- elements from his previous three works. Shibusawa Tatsuhiko, Uh, who's a uh, famous post-war uh, writer of fantasy and n- experimental novels and so forth, a great admirer of Ishikawa's, praised the story's fantastical quality, likening it to the literary and musical form of the conte fantastique. William J. Tyler, who of course is the uh, major Anglophone scholar who introduced uh, Ishikawa to um, the uh, world, the English-speaking world. Um, Donald Keane actually technically introduced Ishikawa in 1960 with his translation of Shion Monogate, but William Tyler expanded on that and uh, translated many of his works and uh, wrote about Ishikawa's um, stories in several books. William J. Tyler said the work, quote, possesses the phantasmagorical and surrealistic elements characteristic of Ishikawa's mature fiction, adding that, quote, no other pre-war work anticipates better his experimental novels, end quote. And the prominent scholar and critic Noguchi Takehiko noted its phantasmagorical and surrealistic quality, describing it as less a proper novel, Shosetsu, than a sort of conte fan- fantastique, a melancholy daydream about a young painter who came under the spell of a nervalesque daydream, end quote. Despite this widespread, widespread praise and multiple re- reissuings, the work has received only scant serious critical attention. Apart from a recent article by Takeuchi Masayuki and a short essay by Suzuki Sadami, the extant commentary provides little in-depth analysis of the text. Crucially, the critical attention tends to downplay the work's fantastical or unreal qualities, presumably out of a fear of downgrading the work from the realm of pure literature, Jim Bungaku, to the realm of middle-brow entertainment or popular literature, Taishu Bungaku. Izawa Yoshio exemplifies this trend when he uses the term symbolic, shoujo-fu, and conceptual, kanen-fu, rather than fantastical, genso-fu, to describe this and other Ishikawa works. But clearly the work is more than just a symbolic or conceptual story. At its core, it represents an early instance of post of modern fantasy literature, Genso Bungaku, which would become a mainstay of post-war fiction several decades later. The work abounds in fantastical elements, flashbacks, hallucinations, descent into madness, flights of fantasy, and daydreams, all blurring the line between dream and reality, symbolicity and literality. This chapter seeks to fill the gap in the extant scholarship by showing how the work employs fantasy to challenge the norms and conventions of shajitsushugi, that perennial target of Ishikawa's early writings. More specifically, I argue that the work constitutes a qualified instance of Tsvetan Todorov's famous genre of the fantastic. And as my students all know, Todorov is the author of the very influential work called The Fantastic, which kind of systematizes this um, uh, theory of the fantastic in literature and divides it into three categories of the fantastic, the uncanny, and the marvelous. And I argue here that the work is a qualified instance of Todorov's genre of the fantastic. I say qualified since the story can be read in both the literal or realistic and poetical or metaphorical registers. I have employed Todorov's notion of the fantastic as it provides a useful framework for exploring the points of intersection between the work's literal, fantastical, and symbolic elements. The plot of Yamazakura can be summarized as follows. An unnamed narrator, a struggling painter, Watakshi, Watashi, finds himself lost in a field somewhere in the middle of the Musashi Plain on the far outskirts of Tokyo. He recounts how his journey began the previous day when he suddenly recalled a line from a book about the French symbolist poet Gérard de Neuval, whose uh, quotation I read at the beginning of this chapter. The line, 
Gerard de Naval, a black fedora atop his tall figure, his black manteau streaming in the night wind, triggered one of Watashi's regular weird and unfortunate hallucinations, which lured him outside, still in his pajamas, in apparent pursuit of the ghost of the long-dead poet. His disheveled appearance attracts the attention of a police officer, who briefly questions him. Upon release, Watashi decides to buy back his suit from a local pawn shop, but lacking the necessary funds, he must first stop by his uncle's house in Aoyama to ask for a loan. His uncle, after lending him a small sum of money, tells him to get a real job and recommends he visit his cousin, Yoshinami Zensaku, at his villa in the Tokyo suburb of Kokubunji, if he needs more immediately. The next day, the today of the opening passage, Watashi finds himself lost en route to his co cousin's villa. After discovering the map his uncle provided does not match the actual geography. Sprawled out in the grass, Watashi begins to muse over his lazy, scruffy, and shameless disposition, wondering whether it is the product of nature or nurture, fate or environment. Just as he's about to give up and return home, he encounters at the side of a road a single wide wild cherry tree swaying in the breeze, end quote. The seemingly mystical tree triggers another of his recent weird and unfortunate hallucinations, this time inducing a flashback to an experience 12 years earlier, a day he was hired to take a photograph of Kyoko, his former lover under a cherry tree in the backyard of her house in the upscale Aoyama area of Tokyo. At the height of his, his hallucination, he sees himself plowing my way through a thousand wild cherry trees at some landmark spot. Just then a boy appears, momentarily interrupting his hallucination. Watashi recalls having met the boy several years earlier. The boy recognizes Watashi as the man who paints pictures and proceeds to lead him to his home deep in the forest. Upon arrival, Watashi is shocked to find his cousin Zensaku on the balcony lashing Kyoko, now Zensaku's wife, with a whip. Watashi fell, falls backward onto the boy and notices that the boy bears a striking resemblance to himself. He starts to panic, wondering if the boy might be his own son and whether Zensaku knows about his affair with Kyoko. Despite the danger, Watashi continues to walk into this potentially explosive situation. Once inside, he finds Kyoko si sitting silently near the window. He calls out but gets no response. After several failed attempts at conversation, he tries to sketch her portrait but can only draw a rough outline. Growing increasingly vexed by Kyoko's reticence, he calls to her repeatedly but still gets no response. Suddenly, Zensako appears. Watashi quickly tries to hide his unfinished portrait, but his nervous hands could only fumble clumsily as the still, faceless portrait fluttered to the floor, scattering in full view. The scene becomes even more surreal when the boy starts up his toy train and Zenzaku begins flaying the carp in the pond with his whip. Just as Watashi is about to slide into a state of permanent madness, he realizes that the woman cannot be Kyoko. Kyoko died of pneumonia the previous winter. At this point in the story, the narrating Watashi, rather than resolving his account with a simple return to reality after an unsettling dream, continues for several more lines. The story ends as it began in media res with the narrated Watashi readying himself for his fated confrontation with his rival Zensaku, who now stands before him, fervently brandishing his whip under the inordinately luminous shafts of sunlight, end quote. Only from the fact that Watashi lived to tell his story can we infer that he managed to defeat or at least elude his rival. If the Fair One showcases an array of cultural and literary references from both East and West, what I am calling surface mediation, the wild cherry tree draws its illusions primarily from Western cultural sources, French literature, American literature, Greek mythology. The first illusion is a line about the French symbolist poet Gérard de Naval, who, following Iwano Jaume's 1913 translation of Arthur Simon's The Symbolist Movement in Literature, 1899, had a profound impact on Japanese letters. The reference links Watashi to the idyllic world of Paris, the idyllic Paris of the Belle Epoque, the romantic literary persona of the poet Maudit, and symbolist poetry. Poet 
Maudit is, of course, uh, the cursed poet, a uh, sort of common archetype that w one finds in uh, symbolist poetry, especially uh, French symbolist poetry. The second allusion is to Edgar Allan Poe's The System of Dr. Tarr and Profes Professor Fether, 1845, which links Watashi to his traumatic past from which he has never from which he has been severed. The word teetotum recalls the following passage in which an, the unnamed narrator, a visitor to a mental hospital in southern France, writes, quote, At the same moment, the man with the teetotum, teetotum predilection set himself to spinning around the apartment with immense energy and with arms outstretched at right angles with his body, so that he had all the air of a teetotum, in fact, and knocked everybody down that happened to get in his way. Um, uh, this mention of teetotum recalls the scene from the... Okay, I have to clean that paragraph a little bit. And the third allusion comes when Watashi compares himself to Icarus the Greek mythological figure who tried to escape from Crete with waxen feather wings only to drown after flying too close to the sun. And here's the quotation from Yamasakura. As I made my way onto the lot, weaving through the massive looming trees, a searing pain ran across my forehead. The sensation intensified with every step I took toward the house and soon grew so fierce that I began to catch fire at my hair roots, not unlike the overreaching Icarus, whose insatiable curiosity brought him fatally close to the sun. I gave my head one hard shake to cool the pain and then peered up through the thick leaves over ha overhanging the balustrade of the protruding second floor balcony two fervid eyes were glaring back at me. And that's a quotation from the story Yamazakura. All the quotations um, in this book are my own translations, I should mention. And uh, the full translation of the story is included in the second, or in the final section of this 500-page uh, tome. This comparison, which constitutes another example of surface mediation, okay, you will recognize these terms, surface mediation, reflexive mediation, deep mediation, and so forth, uh, that I explained in the introduction to uh, this tome. This comparison, which constitutes another example of surface mediation that filters experience through literary and cultural precedents, is neither arbitrary nor capricious. Just as Icarus sought to transcend the limitations of everyday existence and reach the forbidden object, the sun, Watashi is drawn toward his former lover despite the risks. Okay, that's the end of that section. Next section is called uh, The Wild Cherry Tree as a Qualified Instance of the Fantastic. This is uh, Todorov's genre of the fantastic. If we ignore for a moment the seven decades between 1880 and 1950, we might regard fantasy literature rather than shajitsugi as the dominant mode of literature for much of Japan's history. The roots of fantasy can be traced to Japan's earliest works of antiquity, starting with the first two official written myth mythical histories. Kojiki, uh, 711 to 712 that was written in and Nihon Shoki the Chronicles of Japan written in 720 which contain myriad descriptions of supernatural events from Japan's distant past classical tales monogatai such as Taketori Monogatai which we did the other day uh, the tale of the bamboo cut cutter 10th century uh, Genji Monogatai uh, the tale of Genji uh, early 11th century and Uji Shui Monogatai uh, I need to include the translation there, early 13th century, are replete with scenes of magic, spirit possession, and other supernatural phenomena. And, um, right, pause it for a second, I gotta make a change real quick. Okay, continuing, we gotta pick up the pace too, I have a meeting in about 20 minutes, we gotta get uh, f to the end of this chapter by then. Um, classical tales such as are replete with sc scenes of magic, spirit possession, and other supernatural phenomena. Buddhist setsuwa, or morality tales, the most famous of which are the collections Nihon Ryoki, the records of miraculous events in Japan, compiled around 787 to 824, and Konjaku Monogatai Shu, tales of times now past, circa 1120 abound with elements of magical folklore, palaces, skeletons, and supernatural beings, angels, dragon kings, 
dream revelations, intraspecies metamorphoses, reincarnations and transmigration, rinne, and countless instances of karmic retribution, inga oho, and medieval no dramas, especially those of the Mugen variety or dream variety, often deal with the supernatural world of spirits and hallucinations. <coughs> In the Edo period, fantastical and non-realistic elements permeate the Yomihon ghost stories of Ueda Akinari, who lived in the uh, latter half of the 18th century. The later Yomihon historical romances of Takizawa Baking, 767-1848, are his dates. Kabuki and Joruri play puppet plays frequently draw from classical Chinese ghost stories and legends. And the popular custom of Hyaku Monogatai, or telling 100 weird s or scary stories, share uh, these uh, fantastical elements from which the modern v genre fanta fantasy literature in part grew out of. Indeed, fantasy is so pervasive in Jap traditional Japanese literature that it is hard to say whether... Um, Alright, we need to clean up this section a little bit. Uh, further, spirits possession... And um, this last, uh, these last few sentences of this paragraph need some cleaning. I'm going to skip them for now. Something about mono, the relationship between mononoke and monogatai. Although Ishikawa's story draws explicitly from Western literary and cultural sources, it is important to keep in mind this broader history of fantasy in traditional Japanese literature as we read Ishikawa's story. Next paragraph. During the Meiji period, fantasy literature receded into the shadows. But it did not disappear altogether. This is a very important point. It receded into the shadows, but it did not uh, disappear altogether in the major period. If you haven't memorized the uh, dates of the um, major periods of Japanese history, go ahead and do so immediately. The major period, of course, begins 1868 and ends in 1911. And this is the period in which Japan uh, modernized and westernized and it kind of suppressed some aspects of its traditional literature during this period. This is a crucial point that is often lost in standard literary histories, which, stro which show a strong bias toward realism. Oka Yasuo dates, he's an uh, important literary critic, dates the roots of modern Japanese fantasy to Natsume Soseki's Yumejuya, or Ten Nights of Dream, 1908. But in fact, its origins trace at least as far back as the supernatural stories of Izumi Kyoka and Koda Lohan, published in the 1890s. In the early 20th century, fantasy persisted as a powerful, if subdued, force, forming an undercurrent to mainstream realism. Even the two great realist writers of the Meiji period, Natsume Soseki and Mori Ogai, integrated elements of fantasy into their works. Ogai's celebrated Sancho Dai, or Sancho the Steward, 1915, his unfinished novel Kaijin, The Ashes of Destruction, 1911 and 1912, and stories Kanzan Jitoka, Hanshang, and Shida, 1916, Utakata no Ki, A Sad Tale, 1890, and Gyogenki, uh, you Shuan 1915 all include supernatural elements, supernatural events, and characters and plots derived from legends. And Soseki explored dreams elements in works such as, uh, in addition to Yume Juya, which I just mentioned, uh, Koto no Sorane, Hearing Things 1905, London To, Tower of London 1905, and Maboroshi no Tate 1905 as well. Alright, so Soseki put out three works of fantasy in that same year. And continuing, uh, in the Taisho period, so the Taisho period follows the Meiji period, this undercurrent of fantasy merged with symbolism and modernism in the works of Akutagawa Ryunosuke, Kawabata Yasunari, Miyazawa Kenji, Edogawa Lampo, Taizaki Jinichiro, Sato Haruo, Okamoto Kido, Inaga Kitaruho, Uchida Hyakken, Yume no Kyusaku, Maki no Shinichi, and many others. These writers blurred the lines between dreams and reality to explore the uncanny, the unconscious, and the supernatural. They emphasized incorporeal spirit over material things, injecting fantastical elements into the works as veiled critiques of modernity and consumer culture. The powerful return of the modern literary genre of fantasy constitutes all that had been repressed by modernity. These continued in the works of the early Showa period, with writers such as Hagiwara Sakutaro, 
Dazai Osama, Makina Shinichi, and others exploring the world of hallucinations, drugs, and wanderlust, and using metaphysical riddles, defamiliarization, alternate dimensions, utopias and dystopias, metamorphoses, metaphors and allegories, madness and sanity to lead the way. By the 1950s, fantasy had... I should mention here that one could write an entire book, and several uh, have. Susan Napier, of course, comes to mind about uh, fantasy in modern Japanese literature. I'm just giving a very um, uh, short, abridged um, overview of the entire subject in these few pages here, just to give you a sense of what uh, the, the, the backdrop um, against which Ishiko is writing the story. By the 1950s and the subsequent period um, and the the rise of fantasy literature after the war. By the 1950s, fantasy had all but eclipsed realism as the dominant mode of literary fiction in Japan by the 50s. In the 1960s, avant-garde novelists such as Shibusawa Tatsuhiko, Abe Kobo, Terayama Shuji led the revival of the Genso Shosetsu, or fantasy novel, establishing Japan's first fantasy journal, Genso Tokaiki, Roman Fantastique, in 1973. This journal was followed by another, Genso Bungaku, Fantasy Literature, in 1983. Today, the novels of Murakami Haruki, Furukawa Hideo, Kanai Mieko, Enjo To, and Takahashi Genichiro, not to mention the myriad works of anime, manga, and other forms of popular culture, all speak to the fact that magical realism, science fiction, hyperrealism, speculative fiction, and other forms of fantasy now constitute the mainstream of Japanese fiction. And the fantasy turn as I call it here, extends uh, beyond literature as well. Artists such as Tadanori Yoko, Aida Makoto, and Murakami Takashi all deal with uh, elements of fantasy and alternative imagined worlds. Indeed, whatever the artistic media, we can say that fantasy has come to occupy the position that once belonged to realism. This shift in aesthetic will no doubt affect how future scholars will view the literary histories of the Meiji, Taisho, and Showa periods. Despite the long-standing view that realism represents the mainstream of modern Japanese literature, this putative mainstream is in fact punctuated with many anomalies that incorporate, incorporate, incorporate elements of the supernatural and fantastic, so many in fact that the supposed exceptions are in fact the rule. Right, I'm going to stand up for the rest of this. I make sure we're still recording. All right, continuing. The wild cherry tree is clearly an instance of modern fantasy literature, Genso Bunaka. The work is a kind of fantasia, a potpourri of a free and somewhat improvisory treatment that describes a free flight of fancy of markedly improvised character in a dreamlike mood. That's um, fragments of a definition of fantasy uh, that I took from a dictionary on literary genres. I give uh, the source in the footnote. I'm not going to read that here. More specifically, uh, Yamazakura, th the work, is a qualified instance of Todorov's literary genre of the fantastic, as I mentioned above. Qualified because it can be read, read both literally, i.e. Real realistically, and poetically, i.e. symbolically. From the opening lines, the reader is invited to read the story in two registers, both registers, one literal, one poetical. According to Todorov, the possibility of symbolic or allegorical interpretation necessarily disqualifies a work from the category of the fantastic. Okay, so the possibility of a symbolic or allegorical reading disqualifies a work from being a work of the fantastic in Todorov's view, but by expanding his definition to ex include the possibility of poetic interpretations, we may count Ishikawa's story as an instance of the genre. Todorov famously defined the fantastic as a literary genre characterized by hesitation. Underline this word hesitation, key word here. In Todorov's theory, this hesitation, he explains, can take place either on the part of the reader in deciding whether to interpret the events of the story as real or unreal, natural or supernatural, or on the part of any of the characters. Todorov posited three conditions for the fantastic. And here's an extended quote from his book, The Fantastic. First, the text must oblige the reader 
to consider the world of the characters as a world of living persons and to hesitate between a natural and supernatural explanation of the events described. Second, this hesitation must, may also be experienced by the, a character. Thus, the reader's role is to is so to speak entrusted to a character and at the same time the hesitation is represented it becomes one of the themes of the work in case of naive reading the actual reader identifies himself with the character third the reader must adopt a certain attitude with regard to the text he will reject allegorical as well as poetic interpretations these three requirements do not have an equal value the first and the third actually constitute the genre the second may not be fulfilled. Nonetheless, most examples satisfy all three conditions. End quote. <clears throat> the wild cherry tree clearly meets the first two of these conditions. First, it is set in a world of living persons, immediately raising questions about whether the story is situated in reality or a illusion. Second, that question raised not only for the reader, but also for the narrator. That question is raised, it should say. That question raised. Let me finish that, fix that. Pause. As I elucidate below, we should note here that Todorov regards this second condition as less a necessary condition than a tendency. The third condition, however, which, which requires the reader to reject allegorical as well as poetic interpretations, is more problematic. Indeed, this condition has historically proved the most controversial of the three. After all, what literary texts can only be read on a literal level? Are not all literary texts at least open to the possibility of a poetic, i.e. metaphorical, symbolic, or allegorical reading? Though the wild cherry tree is not explicitly symbolic or metaphorical work, it is at least open to the possibility of metaphorical interpretation. On this question, I am inclined to agree with Christine Brooke Rose, who argues that metaphoric or poetic interpretability and the fantastic are not mutually exclusive. By adding Brooke Rose's proviso that the third condition is not an absolute requirement, we can expand Todorov's definition to include the possibility of a metaphoric or allegorical reading. And I have a footnote there to... Um, uh, with some information about Brooke Rose's book on the fantastic, uh, where she makes this uh, proviso. The Wild Cherry, tr Cherry Tree thus falls into the category of works that can be read both literary, uh, literally, as a straightforward story about a man's journey to his cousin's villa in search of a loan, and symbolically, as a man's descent into his past in order to confront his unresolved trauma. As the story opens, Watashi <coughs> seems to be trying to establish a chain of causality that might explain his present circumstances. Starting with the most recent event, how he managed to lose his way along the confusing path, this confusing path, and working back from there. He recalls how he was thrown into one of his weird and unfortunate hallucinations by a certain wild cherry tree, Yamazakura, that appeared in the fork in the road, and how the previous day he had wandered outside after reading a line about Gerard de Naval's Black Manteau streaming in the w night wind. Manteau, Manteau streaming in the white n night wind. Yet <laughs> this... <laughs> Retroactive in plotting of causes goes back no farther than the previous day, and he is unable to trace the chain of causation back to any original point. He is a man severed from his past, a past that does not extend beyond the previous day. The immediately identifiable causes for his present circumstances are not sufficient to explain them, and unless he can somehow locate an older, more primary cause, he will remain forever stuck in a hopeless present and unable to proceed into the future. He has reached a deadlock, both physically, he is lost in a field, unable to reach his destination, and metaphorically, he is a man cut off from both his past and future. Viewed in this light, his journey represents an unconscious attempt to discover the truth of his past, to identify the causes for his current deadlock, and, if possible, to break the deadlock. Where the typical Shadzitsugi work regards language as a transparent and unmediated medium capable of copying sha actuality, jitsu, 
the wild cherry tree deploys a web of images and metaphors that are charged with symbolic intensities. The wild cherry tree, the boy, the boy, Nerval's manteau, Wadakshi's hallucinatory fits, Kyoko, Zenzaka, the house, the forest, and the winding road, inviting the reader to interpret the work poetically as an extended metaphor of man's descent into his own psyche. The opening passage, written in the Josetsu Buntai, or verbose style, that characterizes Ishikawa's early fiction, I talk about the Josetsu Buntai in one of the previous chapters, can be interpreted in two registers, literal and metaphoric. And here is the opening line in my translation. The way is difficult to comprehend, yet when sketched out, it looks easy. But the fact that it can be only be traced in rough outline suggests just how recondite it really is. For not only are the straight and winding lines that s I scrawl here in the dirt with the tip of my walking stick terribly convoluted, but along the way there are also countless hills, houses, streams, and groves, and investigating all of this, I start to trail off into a daze. No longer sure of even the general direction of my destination, I am cognizant of only two points, my location at present and Kokobunji Station where I alighted from the train some time ago. End quote. Literally, the way refers to the actual path that cuts through the Musashi Plain region and leads to Zensaka's villa in the quiet Kokobunji suburb, but it can also be read poetically as a mo metaphor for the long and torturous path leading into the recesses of the psyche where Watashi will encounter the truth of his past. Interpreted in the second register, the recondite road becomes a route connecting reality to dreams, present to past, consciousness to unconsciousness. Watashi's description of the difficulty involved in following the way, the michi, also carries philosophical overtones, as if to suggest that it is only by following this path that he can bridge his severed past to his dreary present. The specific traumatic event from his past is the affair with Kyoko. The experience, the initial courtship, the conquest, her impregnation, and the subsequent separation, all of which is only subtly hinted at in the text, has effectively destabilized Watashi, rendering him unable to get on with his life. Kyoko appears to have broken off their relationship in order to marry his cousin and rival-in-law Zen Saku, and the resulting sense of rejection and defeat has caused Watashi a traumatic injury from which he has yet to recover. To overcome this experience, he must first revisit this past trauma, even if only at an unconscious level. Since it cannot be revisited literally, it must be revisited symbolically, subconsciously, via this dreamlike journey. The events of the story are thus an extended metaphor for Watashi's journey into the deep recesses of his psyche and by extension his repressed past, which can only be accessed through fantasy or dreams. Everything Watashi experiences after encountering the wild cherry tree at the fork in the road can be understood as the exaggerated reenactment of this original traumatic experience. The strange scene that transpires inside the villa is a distorted reenactment of the original trauma. Watashi is at r risk of losing himself completely to the dream and lapsing into madness, a condition to which he is already prone. Despite all this, he presses on toward Zensaku's villa. It is only by journeying into the, this dark realm of repressed memory, guilt, and desire that he can resolve his dilemma, face his past, and break through the intractable impasse. But as we shall see, reclamation of the lost object ultimately proves impossible. In his essay on the wild cherry tree, Takechi Masayuki describes Watashi as a man who has no past or present and is en route to an unknown future. But this is misleading, since Watashi clearly does have a past, including his relationship with Kyoko, which is essential to the story. His journey to Zensaka's villa represents his unconscious attempt to bridge the chasm between his pa present and past selves. Both his immediate present and his uncertain future are inextricably tied to this lost past, and only by reenacting his trauma can he come to understand his present circumstances and direction in life. 
the reader, finding both the literal and poetical readings equally justified, hesitates, in the Todorovian sense, to privilege one interpretation over the other, and instead opts to read the story in both registers. As the literal interpretation is self-evident, the following discussion will focus on the poetic interpretation, which requires some elucidation. Here's the next section. Three lures, Nerv Nervals, Manto, the Wild Cherry Tree, and Zentaro. Like the fair one, Kajing, the Wild Cherry Tree, Yamazakura, features a narrator who is out of place in the modern world, a rootless drifter who wanders the Tokyo outskirts, refusing to find work, even as much of the country is preparing for war, a self-described no-talent dobber, who ekes out a living by borrowing money from relatives and pawning f for small change his sole possession, a casual day-to-day -day business suit, the one linked to the one linked to outside everyday social reality, prone to daydreams and hallucinations, he seems on the verge of mental collapse, possessed by some vague compulsion. But where the narrator of the fair one is in possession of an external entity, Pan, the Greek god. The narrator here is haunted by a distant and repressed memory, and it is the reenactment of this affair that Watashi unconsciously seeks. From the opening lines, he seems to be hurtling towards some un some predetermined destination, which we soon learn is the Spanish-style villa of his cousin Zensaku and his wife. Three images appear in the story to guide Watashi toward his fated destination, the deadly vortex of Zensaka's villa, the site where he will relive trauma and, if possible, retrieve his lost love. The first is an unidentified quotation about the French symbolist poet Gérard de Naval, which induces one of his regular weird and unfortunate hallucinations, luring him into the streets, still in his pajamas in apparent pursuit of the long spirit of the long dead French poet. He explains the significance of this transinducing line, which constitutes an instance of surface mediation, as follows. And here is the uh, extended passage. How on earth did I end up here? I must have drifted far afield while navigating this arduous, unfamiliar path. But how? It must have been that wild cherry tree at the fork in the road. And why in God's name did I wander outside in the first place? Blame it on Gerard de Naval's black manteau, perhaps. Summarily attributing calls to this or that dead poet is unscrupulous, I know. But the fact that is that, but the fact is that early yesterday afternoon I left my tiny upstairs room on the edge of Kanda, still in my nightgown, and roamed the street for four hours, all in pursuit of this black manteau of Gerard de Naval's. Not that there's anything special about it, it's just that a certain line from a book I recently read, Gerard de Naval, a black fedora atop his tall figure, his black manteau streaming in the night wind, had somehow stuck with me. And I would often recall this image as though I'd encountered the poet himself. Unable to remain holed up in my apartment, I would be whisked up into the air as if by some magic curse and, lapsing into delirium, would leap outside, heedless of whether it was midday or midnight. Such, you see, is the burden of my weird and unfortunate hallucinations." End quote. Though the precise relevance of this quotation is left unexplained, its particular effect on Watashi clearly stems from its connection to the poet Maudit, the cursed poet archetype of French symbolism. Gérard de Naval himself was precisely one such quintessential poet Maudit. He was known for his eccentric stories and lifestyle, including fa including the famous antidote, anecdote, it should say here, famous anecdote, famous anecdote. Including the famous anecdote about how he would take his pet lobster for a walk down the boulevards on a leash made of blue ribbon. Okay, so most people when they hear the name Naval, they think of that famous anecdote of him walking his lobs pet lobster along the streets of Paris. He eventually lost his mind, hanging himself in 1855 from a window grate 
with an apron string that he believed to be the Queen of Sheba's garter. Watashi seems to regard himself as a kindred spirit to Nerval, doomed perhaps to a similar fate. The second visual that deepens his trance and propels him toward his fated destination is the titular wild cherry tree, the Yamazakura, that Watashi stumbles upon shortly after losing his way en route to his cousin's villa. As he puts it, I turn my gaze upward, and lo and behold, there in midair is a single wild cherry tree swaying in the breeze, something just as insignificant as Gerard du Naval's black manteau, yet somehow more determinative. The mystical tree appears just as he is about to give up his request, his quest and return home, marking a turning point in the story. It represents the critical threshold between reality and fantasy and by extension the last chance for Watashi to turn back. Everything that Watashi experiences after encountering the tree cannot be understood as the imaginary reenactment of his past affair with Kyoko. In the following passage, Watashi associates the tree with an experience involving Kyoko. Here's the passage. Let me back up a bit. About 12 years ago, I took a photograph of the judge's daughter, Kyoko, standing under a similar wild cherry tree in the yard of a house in Aoyama in Tokyo. At the time, I was very taken with photography and was always lugging around one of those heavy cameras that require a tripod. I photographed her only this once. It must have been to commemorate her imminent marriage that spring to my distant relative Yoshinami Zensaka, now a reserve cavalry colonel and executive at some fertilizer company. And as I recall, the judge had come out onto the veranda to look on. Yet as I stood under the wild cherry tree at the side of the dirt road just now, what possessed me was not so much the memory of Kyoko as the ghost in that camera. It was as if someone had stolen her from behind, pulled that black red line focusing cloth over my head, and thrust the lens up to my bewildered eyes, for I could see nothing but a shower of petals fluttering in mid-air, giving me the sensation that I was ploughing my way through a thousand wild cherry trees at some landmark spot. End quote. Like its parent species, the sakura, the cherry blossom, the yamazakura, wild cherry blossom, often appears in traditional poetry and folklore with associations of transience, ephemerality of life, and the pathos of things, monono awarde. It is said to be the dwelling place of mystical mountain spirits. In the Edo period, the tree was a favorite of the influential Kokugaku or national learning scholar Motori no Rinaga, 1730 to 1801, who often wrote about its mystical allure in his commentaries on classical literature. In modern literature, the tree, the Yamazakura tree, wild cherry tree, came to be associated with madness, as seen in the popular works such as Kaji i Moto Jiro Sakura no Kino Shita Niwa, Under the Cherry Trees, 1928, and Sakaguchi Ango Sakura no Mori no Mankai no Shita Ni, In the Forest Under the cherry ble- Cherries in Full Bloom, 1949. Ishikawa uses the motif of the cher- wild cherry tree in a similar sense, ignoring the connotations that it had accrued in 1930s, and uh, by 1936, the time of the work's publication, cherry blossoms had come to symbolize J- Japanese militarism, nationalism, and self-sacrifice in the name of the emperor. But Ishikawa uses the image of the image as a mystical force that casts a spell on Watashi, and also as a metaphorical bridge that connects Watashi's present to his past and links it symbolically to Kyoko, hinting at her wild, otherworldly nature that seems out of place in this upscale domestic setting. Just as the line about no Nerval's black manteau had done, the tree lifts Watashi out of everyday reality and plunges him into the realm of the strange, the fantastic, to borrow the words of the narrator of the fair one in the final passage of that story. The third entity that appears out of the blue to guide Watashi towards his, desti- toward his destination is the boy, Zentaro. The boy functions as a kind of tsude, or companion, the second character, secondary character of a no drama, often a priest or traveler, who appears at the outset and leads the lost Watashi to the villa deep in the forest. In his Ishikajun Zenki Sakuhin Kaidoku, deciphering Ishikajun's early works, 1998, scholar Azechi 
Yoshihiro argues that the work can be read as having structural similarities with the Mugen type of no drama, with Zentaro as the tsurde or companion, the Ai watashi, watashi corresponding to the Waki, Kyoko to the shite, or the main character, and Zensaku to the shite kata, masked actor who plays the shite. I would add that this scene also recalls the Michiyuki or going along the road to death scene that one o often finds in no drama, Jōruri puppet theater, and kabuki, the poetic travel scenes that often end in the character's death. As Watashi approaches the villa, which again serves as a metaphor for the center, center of his own psyche, he grows increasingly detached from language and rational thought. The sudden appearance of the boy leaning on a red, small red bicycle returns Watashi to his senses. The boy recognizing Watashi offers to lead him to the villa. At first, Watashi is unaware of the connec their connection, but as they proceed, he starts to notice their uncanny resemblance. And here's an extended quote where the boy where he recognizes that the boy might be his own son. My hand clung to his slender shoulder, but no sooner did our eyes meet than I let out a scream and then collapsed to the ground as if suddenly cast into the fiery depths of hell, for the face staring back at me was none other than my own, the spitting image of myself, the same countenance, the same physiognomy. The boy's features were identical to what I see in the mirror. Had I stumbled into some secret plot, I began to suspect that I had. But what devil could have laid this snare and suckered me into it? And what could have possessed him to ensnare me in it? My heart was now pounding in my chest. Or come to think of it, my heart had been throbbing wildly from the moment I saw Zentaro's face up close in the paddy. I initially dismissed the thought that Zentaro could have been my own been of my own blood. It seemed too contrived, too melodramatic, like something out of a cheap romance novel. But now that my whole body was clattering uncontrollably in a fit of chills and fever and cold sweat, had I bec had I suddenly come down with the egg, I could no longer laugh the thought away so easily. No longer could I dismiss it as a mere cliche was this sudden attack a sign from Kyoko, a piercing warning not to come inside? To be sure, the whole thing does smack of melodrama, but for me this was no laughing matter. Who can scoff at a seemingly trivial pain, a mere broken fingernail, when that pain is so terribly and inescapably real? So complete was my shock that it left no room for contrition or regret. It knocked me out cold as a hunk of dead fish." End quote. Though not revealed explicitly, what Watashi realizes here is that the boy is most likely his own illegitimate son, the result of his affair with Kyoko twelve years earlier. He notices a striking resemblance to himself, so striking that he initially thinks he has encountered his double or his mirror image. Watashi's subsequent interior monologue reveals his initial reaction to this discovery. And here's another extended quote, interior, most of it uh, is interior monologue. But what devil had dug this pit for me to fall into? And how long had he been lying in silent ambush for me? Perhaps Zensaku is behind it, I thought. Yes, that would explain the menacing glare he gave me the moment I set foot on his lot, the instant his very glance singed my forehead. Then again, is that nitwit even capable of prying open my secret with a single glance? Or does one's intelligence even matter in light of such an egregious offense? I can see how the offending party, myself in this case, might remain oblivious in happy ignorance. But... Could that oblivion ever be within the realm of possibility for the offended party? Even someone as dull-witted as Zensaku must have noticed his striking resemblance between the boy and myself when he saw us standing together at the threshold, even if he had long been ignorant of the notion, and the realization would surely have come as a major blow to his pride. On second thought, what if it had never been a sudden realization at all? What if he had been privy to it all along? Perhaps he's uh, long been quietly orchestrating this inexorable confrontation, patiently waiting for the, just the right moment to ambush me. That would explain Kyoko's behavior just now, how she was willing to writhe under the lashes of his whip without making so much as a peep as a kind of self-punishment. 
Clearly the only person for whom this reality had come as a shock was myself. For everyone else in the Yoshinami clan, the issue had long been an open secret, which had now swelled beyond, well beyond the easy ripples of jealousy and suspicion, and descended into the dangerous river of swirling eddies. And here I was, blind fool that I am, standing in the eye of this deadly vortex, my nostrils dilated like goblets, dragging my torn shoes toward the house in the pitiful hope of procuring a small loan of all things. End quote. With his initial fear now confirmed, Watashi begins to wonder if Zensaku might suspect the boy's true origins. From Kyoko's willingness to submit to her husband's abuse, Watashi deduces that she must know the truth and regards her lashing as fair punishment for her infidelity. Only the boy remains unaware of the tensely unfolding love triangle, innocently escorting his biological father to their house, referring to him uh, only as the man who paints pictures. By this point, Watashi's awareness of his past has evolved from a hazy impression to full recognition. He now understands the risks involved in entering the house, but still continues into he the deadly vortex. What drives him is less his stated purpose, procuring a small loan, than his irrepressible urge to confront the traumatic memory, to relive it, and if possible to retrieve the lost object of his desire. Next section, the crisis of representation. This is the final section, language's dual function. Like fair one, the wi wild cherry tree foregrounds the central and perennial theme of modernism, the breakdown of realistic representation. This theme, which highlights the modern rupture between sign and referent, is central to Ishikawa's literary project of the period, his critique of the dominant literary paradigm of modern Japan, Shadetsugi. In chapter 3, I showed how the fair one dramatizes the narrator's inability to depict the world objectively due to his extreme solipsism and possession by Pan. This theme appears in The Wild Cherry Tree, although in different registers. This theme first shows itself in the opening passage where the narrator describes how he is strayed from the way, Michi, or the Dao. As suggested by the usefulness, uh, uselessness of his map, the way is that which divides, defies simple representation or symbolic schemat schematization. This way seems to be vaguely connected with the Tao, that polysemous universal principle in Sino-Japanese philosophical religious traditions, namely Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, by which all cosmic order is achieved and which is similarly impervious to all forms of representation, giving the work certain ethical or philosophical overtones. It is this ethical principle from which Watashi strayed 12 years ago previous, ago previous, fix that real quick, ago previous, of years previous when he had an affair with Kyoko which resulted in their illegitimate son. The ethical overtones are present The ethical overtones are present from the ambiguous phraseology of the first sentence. The way is difficult to comprehend. This phrase echoes many passages from classical Confucian and later Neo-Confucian texts, including the opening passage of the famous work Bendo, Distinguishing the Way, 1717, by Japanese Neo-Confucian scholar Ogyu Sordai. Quote, the way is difficult to comprehend and explain to others because it is truly vast. Confucian scholars of recent eras claim their own individual perceptions to be the entire way, but these perceptions are all only aspects of it. The way is, in fact, the way of the ancient kings. End quote. By beginning the work in this quasi-philosophical manner, register, Iskar injects a vaguely philosophical tenor to his story, inviting readers to interpret it in a more in a moral interpret it as a moral allegory in a moral allegory of a man's attempt to return to the way from which he has strayed in a moral allegory yet it soon becomes clear that this recondite unrepresentable way <laughs> 
leads neither to heaven nor righteous living, but to a traumatic event from the narrator's own personal past. The second variation of this theme, the breakdown of realistic representation, appears during Watashi's flashback involving an incident from 12 years previous in which he was prevented from taking Kyoko's wedding photographs when a shower of petal Yamazakura petals began fluttering in midair, blocking the camera's line of view. There seems to be some kind of causal connection between this mysterious wide little cherry tree and Watashi's inability to observe and photograph Kyoko. Possessed by the ghost in that camera, recall that cameras and photographs were initially believed to have spiritual powers and were often feared for their ability to take spiritual possession of either the photographer or photographed. He floats around in a dazed reverie until reaching this spot in the grass the temporal and spatial location location from which he began his narration. The third variation on this theme appears toward the end of the story when Matashi fails, attempts but fails, to sketch Kyoko's portrait. Kyoko is the obscure and elusive object of his desire, whom he once possessed, then lost, and now must refine, refined. Her face is perpetually obscured whether blocked by, quote, the shadow of a branch that jutted out past the balustrade, end quote, or the petals of the wild cherry tree, nor is this the first time he has failed to depict her image. His past attempts to paint a portrait also resulted in only a blank slate, and here's an extended quotation, Although this was our first meeting in years, I can't say I had expected anything more from her. In the past, I had often tried to sketch her portrait, but the result was always the same, the simple outline of a woman in a kimono. No matter how hard I tried to reproduce the contours of her face, I never seemed to get anywhere. My eyes would invariably grow dim and cloudy as they stared into the blank sheet. Now, too, as I gazed at her seated before me, the pattern of her deep indigo sea wave kimono seemed excessively vibrant beneath her icy profile, which shimmered brightly in the leaves, but even this image seemed to dissolve into the blueness of the air. Taking out several more sheets of my from my pocket, I made another attempt at a sketch and another, but the results after several pages was the same as ever. Surely even a no-talent dauber like me can convey something of her likeness, I told myself, assuming the posture of a master laboring over his still face's masterpiece, while in the back of my mind I wondered what devotion to my craft I had ever n shown. Giving myself over to the ebbs and surges of my agitated heart, I once again called out between gasps, Kyoko, would you please turn this way so I can get a better look at your face? End quote. In short... Kyoko is that female type that often appears in Iskar's early works, the inscrutable, desire-inducing, haunting female presence who propels the narrator protagonist on his way but is herself devoid of any interiority or substance. Even her physical appearance is indeterminate, lacking any distinctive features. At no point in the story is what is she able to get a good look at her. She eludes his grasp on all levels, sexually, mentally, spiritually, artistically, Though he may have possessed her sexually 12 years ago, he can now represent her only negatively as empty space, silence, a blank canvas. Moreover, he regards the act of painting her picture as a violation on par with his previous affair with her. He has doubly offended Zensaka, first by committing the sexual transgression with Kyoko 12 years earlier, and now by figuratively violating her by trying, trying to draw her likeness. When Zensaka appears, Hotoshi rushes to hide his unfinished sketches of Kyoko, but his nervous hands could only fumble clumsily as the face, still faceless, portraits fluttered to the floor, scattering in full view. He now has no choice but to confront his rival Zinsaka. In short, The Wild Cherry Tree is a work that dramatizes the unbridgeable aporia between representation and reality, map and world, portrait and figure, signify and signified, repeatedly disavowing the possibility of a direct correspondence between language and the objective external world. Nor is it the everyday life, the Seikata that constitutes the conventional subject of the naturalist eye novel. This lack of correspondence reflects Iskar's modernist view of language and his renunciation of mimetic realism. 
Moreover, on a more literal level, it relates to Watashi's precipitous descent into madness. For what is madness but the severance of signified from signifier? What is madness but the cessation of meaning, the termination of semantic coherence as such? The work's formal qualities, i.e. Modern en modernist emphasis on rift between language and thing, on the rift between language and thing, it should say, and its content. So the work's formal qu qualities and its content, i.e. Watashi's descent into madness, blend together in this final scene, its content spilling over its content spilling over where are we lost our place by weaving this by weaving the theme of the breakdown of representation into the work's diegetic content Ishikawa seems to suggest that modernist literature is always on the verge of slipping into nonsense madness semiotic personal language the total loss of denotive meaning. Yet this slippage is not inevitable, as attested to by the fact that Watashi manages to survive the experience and weave it into a narrative. The theme of the breakdown of representation dovetails neatly with another theme of the work, the dual role of language. On the one hand, language, the line uh, about Nerval's black mantle specifically, is what triggers Watashi's initial hallucination and dreamlike journey. On the other hand, language is what ultimately re rescues him from his trance and brings him back to everyday reality, rational thought, the shared symbolic world. Language thus serves a double function. It is both that which lures Watashi into this bizarre world of dreams and repressed memory and that which ultimately anchors him back to reason. In fact, Ishka thematizes the salvific function of language in many of his early works. In Fugen, for example, language is likened to a celestial bodhisattva and invested with almost sacred salvational powers. As the narrator of that work describes in a well-known passage at the end of chapter 7, Words can be a source of salvation from nihilism and despair and suicidal thoughts. And here is the quote from that Fugen. Since my tongue continues to function, however sluggishly, let me take this opportunity to be completely frank and admit there have been moments late at night when I have thought I would be better off not living at all. I have kicked back the covers and leap leapt from my bed to shout, I shall die. Bunzo, who is who has heard me cry out like this before, has la la later jokingly asked, not dead yet? I know I run the risk of being thought uh, a fool, but perhaps the reason I am alive today lies in the very nature of my cry. It is as though the vitality of the words to die breathes new life into me. In fact, when I sit silently contemplating death and when the darkness before me seems unfathomably deep, in the moment I lift my voice and raise my troubled cry, flowers fall from heaven and the earth is filled with incense. It is the fragrance of the transcendently beautiful Bodhisattva Samantabhadra, the Fugen Bodhisattva, who rides forth mounted upon his white elephant. In that instant I know words, Kotoba, are my true Bodhisattva. Words are my Samantabhadra, Fugento wa Fugento wa watashi ni tote Kotoba de aru. In a similar vein, the wild cherry tree foregrounds this redemptive potential of language, albeit in less metaphorical, metaphysical terms. In the work's final scene, language functions as the mooring rope that binds the central character to the shared realm of human experience. It is precisely at the moment of his imminent disintegration, disintegration that Watashi manages to pull himself together and make a narrow escape. What ultimately saves him is language, that life rope that binds me to rational thought.
as he puts it. And so the work can be read not only as a metaphorical journey into the world of unfulfilled desires and unconscious guilt, but also as a statement about the paradoxical nature of language. This twofold nature of language is a defining feature, defining feature of all works of fantasy, which employ language not as a parent, transparent medium, as in Shadjitsugi, but as a medium that both binds and unbinds the characters and, by extension, readers to everyday reality. It should be noted, however, that it, language serves it as a stabilizing or preserving force for Watashi only to the degree that he makes a conscious effort to regard it as such. Left to his own devices, our lazy, scruffless, and shameless narrator will continue to spin wildly like a teetotum, comma, into the deadly vortex until he is swallowed by it. In the final scene, he is presented with a fateful choice. He can either let himself slide into permanent delirium, or he can pull himself back up through this mooring rope of language by trusting its power. He recounts the dilemma as follows, and I quote, But this was no time to sink into, sink into a stupor. No circumstances would not permit it. Now was the time for me to cling to that life rope that binds me to rational thought, to reason, to the logos, provided that its ends had not yet completely frayed. But whence this mooring rope? and how to tow myself up by it so that the asylum bells may sound. This was less an indulgent w wish to slip into some grandiose notion of order than a desperate, desperate groping for whatever threadbare strands of language remained. End quote. Time is running out and he must act swiftly. Too weak to take another step, he says. He writes, I crumbled back into the chair and stared blankly into space, no longer caring whether I ended up dead or alive, sane or mad, end quote. Language alone can prevent the total collapse of his rational self. Stealing himself, he mows his option until he totters between dementia and reality, silence and articulation. The scene turns even more surreal when Zentaro dashes toward the balustrade to warn him that he is about to be run over by the boy, by the toy train, and Zensaku changed now into his riding gear as if about to embark on an expedition, end quote, begins to lash his whip at the carp in the pond. Is Zensaku preparing to board the toy train? And if so, where is the train headed? Now note how Watashi once again displays a hesitation in the Todorovian sense, when he wonders whether to interpret the bizarre events in unfolding before his eyes within a rational framework or to attribute them to the supernatural. The rational explanation would move the work toward the genre of the uncanny, the supernatural explanation toward the genre of the marvelous. And ultimately, remember marvelous, uh, think uh, an example of the marvelous, a genre of the marvelous according to Todorov would be uh, Harry Potter, right? Uh, Whereas the Wizard of Oz would be an example of the uncanny, because it can all, all of the strange events that happen in the course of the story can be explained at the end when she wakes up from her dream. So it was all a dream. That's an example of the uncanny. Harry Potter, by contrast, is an example of the marvelous. And where you hesitate between the two poles, that's an example of the uh, fantastic, according to Todorov. And uh, this work by Ishikajun is an example of the fantastic, I have argued here. Ultimately, he opts for the latter. Since any attempt to explain the events rationally would only add to the confusion. The scene inside the house has become too bizarre, too surreal to be committed to rational explanation, and so he decides to suspend his faculty of reason. I know my, quote, I know my story abounds in in inexplicable happenings, but I knew that to make inscrutable conjectures with a no less inscrutable countenance would only add to the confusion so I'd just as soon laugh it off with a guileless air sensing that I was about to poke my head out from a cave and see the world open and re reveal its mysteries I looked out on the scene but because of my wretched habit of blurting out the stupidest things at the most inopportune times all I could say was hey Kyoko do you guys always make your carp swim around the pond like this? But the time, by the time I turned around, Kyoko had vanished, her figure wiped clean, as it were, from the wicker chair, leaving only two or three leaves that the wind had blown down from the lower branches of a nearby cherry tree. Again, a cherry tree. Suddenly it hit me. Kyoko died of pneumonia at the end of last year. How could I have forgotten? End quote. Sensing that some hidden world was about to open up and reveal its mysteries, Tenchi no Hirakere Omoyo Shita, 
He tries once more to communicate with Kyoko, but he turns the chair around only to discover that it is empty. That Kyoko is nowhere to be found. It is at this point that he remembers that Kyoto, Kyoko d- died of consumption the previous winter for the first time since embarking on this journey. Just like that, as if I'd been socked in the nose, the all-enveloping fog started to thin out in patches. But he is not in the clear just yet. One last obstacle still stands in the way of his safe return to reality, his rival Zensaku. In a final whirlwind of unbroken sentences, the narrator leads us right up to the moment of faded confrontation, the inevitable end point of the winding recondite road described in the opening passage, only to abruptly cut his story off. Like the fair one, the wild cherry tree begins and ends in medias res. Quote, but still having to confront the formidable f- shoulders of Zensaku, who continued to stand there fervently brandishing his whip under the inordinately luminous shafts of sunlight, I had no time to steady myself with a breath of air, and so I simply remained there cowering, my collarbone tingling, a shiver running down my spine. End quote. From the fact that Watashi has lived to tell the story, we can infer that he managed to triumph over, or at least elude, his rival. And finally, the conclusion of this chapter. According to Todorov, the genre of the fantastic consists of two types, those in which the required hesitation is between real and illusory, and those in which the required hesitation is between real and imaginary. In works of the first type, the reader or characters are certain that the described events have taken place, but they are not sure how to explain them. In works of the second type, the reader or characters are unsure whether the described events have actually taken place or are simply uh, the product of the character's imagination, i.e. there is the possibility that the events described were just a dream, a hallucination, or a madness or drug-induced vision. The question we are left with then is to which type, illusory or imaginary, does the wild cherry tree belong? The work seems to defy this either or formulation, qualifying as an instance of both kinds. On the one hand, the narrator seems convinced that the events have taken place but is unsure of how to account for them. On the other hand, the reader cannot help but wonder at the end of the story if the whole thing was simply a dream, a hallucination, or a creation of the narrator's overactive imagination. In short, both types of hesitation are present in or produced by the work. Watashi's hesitation qualifies the work as an example of of the fantastic in the first sense, defined by a hesitation between real and illusory. And the reader's hesitation qualifies the work as an example of the fantastic of the second type, defined by a hesitation between real and imaginary. The reader is thus faced with two possible frameworks for interpreting the story. The first option is to accept Watashi's illusory explanation at the end of the story, according to which Kyoko is merely an apparition. In this explanation, Watashi actually visited the villa, actually experienced the series of events described in the story, and actually encountered what he thought to be the living Kyoko. Only it turns out that the Kyoko inside the house was a ghost, the existences of which are possible within the world of the story. This interpretation requires the reader to willfully suspend disbelief and alter their usual conception of the natural world to include the possibility of the existences of supernatural spirits, apparitions, and ghosts. To adopt this illusory explanation is to move the work in a direction of the neighboring genre of the marvelous. Since this explanation ascribes the supernatural event, namely the appearance of Kyoko's ghost, to laws of nature that are different from our own. The other option, the imaginary option, is to dismiss Watashi as a wholly unreliable narrator and conclude that the events of the story, from Watashi's recollection of the line about Nerval's black manteau to the final scene, were all simply the conjurations of an overactive and deranged mind. To adopt this explanation is to move the work near the neighboring genre of the uncanny, since the laws of nature need not be adjusted to explain the strange event, i.e. the strange event can be attributed to figments of Watashi's imagination, ultimately the reader is left with a choice. Was the ghost of Kyoko real, or was it simply a hallucination or produced by Watashi's 
imagination. In other words, was the whole story simply a dream or hallucination prompted by an encounter with the wild cherry tree at the side of the road, an encounter that sends the narrator spiraling toward an encounter with his former lover Kyoko, or did the events described by the narrator actually occur in the real diegetic world of the story? This is the crux question of the work, yet the reader, unable to answer the question satisfactorily, oscillates between these two simultaneously pos plausible interpretations, thereby satisfying Todorov's first condition for the work's inclusion as an instance of the fantastic. And then the final paragraph, I might cut this paragraph, but I'll read it right now um, as it is. It's kind of a mess. In this chapter, I have examined how the work's narrative structure produces Watashi's fractured identity. No, I'm not going to read it. All right. I think we'll probably just cut that paragraph altogether. That's the end of this chapter. I hope you have <laughs> enjoyed it. It has taken a bit longer than I expected, and now I have to... Um, go to my meeting. I'm already 10 minutes late. Goodbye.